Hey, welcome back to the channel, this tactical intellectual channel. Hey, thanks for lending your ear to hear this, um, I guess, display of facts and evidence. We are in the Melanated Europe part two presentation here. So we're going to hit the ground running and get into it. We're about to read an article from the New York Times. This is all the way back Tuesday, January 19th, 1904, and it's entitled Origin of the White Race. We're going to read this, and it says, to the editor of the New York Times of the Anglo-Saxon, the Celts, and the Scandinavian races being white, does that imply that these races belong to the Aryan race? Question mark. The old theory concerning the origin of the European races was based upon certain linguistic peculiarities, and we have all been taught to believe that the white man is of Indo-European origin. Those who claim to be Aryan in lineage trace their ancestry to India, the ancient cradle of civilization. But that old theory has long been exploded by such able men as Professor William Z. Ripley of Columbia College, New York City, in his able work, Races of Europe. Professor Giuseppe Sergi, Professor of Anthropology, University of Rome, Italy, in his work, History of the Mediterranean Races, the late Dr. Brenton, Professor of Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in his work, The Races of Men and the Study of the Human Types by M. Verno in the Smithsonian Institution Report for 1902, page 453, who say that the white Australian and the white Englishmen, white Irishmen, and white Scotchmen and white Dane are not of Indo-European origin, but of an African origin, modified by climate, sunlight, etc. The earliest Europeans were long-headed but dark in color. In every detail, the European dolicephalic resembled the dolicephalic Negroes of Africa, and the earliest races of Europe must have been very dark. Races of Europe, page 446 in parentheses. Okay, so that if the Australian statesmen want to keep Australia only for the white Aryan, then they would exclude the very races <laughs> from which they themselves are derived. Those fellows down in Australia themselves trying to be purist are themselves a mixture of the Africanoid dolicephalic skull race. Dr. M. Bernot says some of the skulls of the Belgians have on each side of the base of the nasal opening a groove characteristic of the Negro and it is possible that there is a connecting link between the African and Caucasian. May it not be possible if these later or latter theories based upon the science of ethnology are correct that the white Australians are only of a secondary or derived origin, a derivative of the African whose dolicephalic skulls resemble in all respects the Anglo-Saxon. XYZ, New York, January 15, 1904. So we're done with that article there. Yeah, we are done with the article, but hey, I have the book, hey, Races of Europe by you know, William Z. Ripley. Hey, we're going to get into this right here. Keep in mind, this guy, William Z. Ripley, he is an anthropologist. And I want to start off with this page right here in particular, 463, to set the tone of this uh you know, keeping up with the theme of this presentation here. Let's get into it. 
page 463 reads, then began the discoveries of abundant prehistoric remains all over Europe, particularly in France. These with one accord tended to show that the European Aborigines of the Stone Age were not mongoloid like the laps after all, but the exact opposite. In every detail, they resembled rather the Doli Cosephalic Negroes of Africa. Now, with that in mind, that takes us to page 125. Let's go ahead and see what that says right there. Page 125 highlighted portion reads, a new phase of the matter was presented by Broca's celebrated researches concerning the physical characteristics of the French people in the decade following 1860, especially those among the peasants in Brittany. Here were the only Celtic speaking people on the continent and they were of a brunette and short race. Then in 1865 came the monumental work of Davis and Thurn Thurnham, the Crania Britannica with added proof that a large part of the Celtic speaking population of the British Isles, particularly the Welsh, were equally short and of dark complexion. Broca and Beddo, among anthropologists, at once grasped the situation. They perceived the inconvenience attended upon the use of the term. Nevertheless, the advocates of the old view of tall, blind Celts still counted eminent authority among their number, such as von Bayer with his and Utemeyer. Proof of a widespread, short and dark population through Central Europe, even in Southern Germany, meanwhile accumulated rapidly at the hands of Ecker, Von Holder, Welker, and others. They, however, dodged the issue by applying new names to this broad-headed, antitonic population, which they discovered in the recesses of the Black Forest and the Alps. These people they called Ligurian, Samartian, Slavic, or Sion types. So really it's very interesting what I just read because uh, you see back in 1865, the book Crania Britannica, they provided extraordinary proof that a large part of the Celtic speaking population especially the welsh they were short statured and dark complected so that brings us to the point that many anthropologists of the time they realized what was happening when that came out right there so you see uh broca and bando they felt that it was inconvenient to associate with using dark complexion that that term right there to describe the early or original population of the British Isles. So really, despite much evidence, there was still many who advocated the old view of the tall, blind Celtic population. And you know, I had to bring this out. Back in 1865, this was considered an outdated view that, that tall blonde head kilt right there. So the image or idea of the Aryan light skinned British Islander or the kilt, that was a highly revered um, image right there. And it was backed by many anthropologists of the times like Von Bayer, his, and Rudemeyer, as it brought out what I, in that portion I read. So the facts and evidence of the dark population of Central Europe and Southern Germany was spreading rapidly when this book came out because uh, honest anthropologists like Ecker, Von Holder, Welker, and others, 
they were telling the truth. So despite spreading the truth, you know, um, Broca and Bado, they really kind of still acted in a deceptive manner because they applied a new name to these dark complected groups. Which groups am I talking about? Well, the non-Tetonic populations in the Black Forest and the Alps. They were calling them um, Ligurian, Sarmatian, Slavic, or Sion types. And all these people here were brunette complected people, brown skinned people. Page 126 in the highlighted portion reads, whatever be the present state of opinion among students of other cognitive sciences, there is practically today a complete unanimity of opinion among physical anthropologists that the term Celt, if used at all, belongs to the second of our three races. It is the rocky, cephalic, darkish population of the Alpine highlands, such as the view of Broca, Bertrand, Tocnard, Collignon, and all the French authorities. It is accepted by the Germans, Rachel, Coleman, and Rank, as well by the English, foremost among them, Dr. Bendo, and by the most competent Italians. Page 127, the highlighted portion up top reads that anthropologists called the tall and blonde people of northern France and Belgium, Gauls or Kimri, and the broad heads of middle and southwestern France, Celts, while Caesar or Kaiser, as we saw, insisted that the Celt and the Gaul were identical. Drop down a little bit. Okay, and it reads, Still greater confusion arises if we attempt to discuss the origin of the people of the British Isles, where this Celtic question enters again. Thus, the people of Ireland and Wales, of Cornwall, and the Scottish Highlands, together with the Bretons in France, would all be Celtic or the ling linguist because they all spoke the Celtic language or the anthropologist. As we shall see, the Breton is as far from the Welsh as in some respects the Welsh are from the Scotch. And after all, the best opinion today is entirely in accord with um, Bella Butte's <laughs> original suggestion of 30 years ago that the Celts of the historians never in fact formed more than the ruling class all through Central Europe. So reading page 126, the whole point is to establish that there was a darkish population as it says right there of the Alpine Highlands right there. We will come back to the dark alpine population, but on page 127 right there, let's just look at how um, the anthropologist and Caesar, there's a disconnect between the two of these guys right here because the anthropologists, they call the tall and blonde people of France and Belgium. They, they group them as Gauls or label them as Gauls or Kimri, whereas uh, Caesar, he called or he saw or viewed the Celts and the Gauls as similar people. So we're going to discuss that a little bit later. We're going to tie everything in together, but let's go back to the um, brown alpine race of people. Page 128, the highlighted portion reads, the word alpine seems best to fit this second racial type which we have isolated. We shall therefore everywhere call the broad-headed type alpine. It centers in that region. It everywhere follows the elevated portions of Western Europe. It is therefore preeminently a mountain type, whether in France, Spain, 
Italy, Germany, or Albania. It becomes less pure in proportion as we go east from the Carpathians across the great plains of European Russia. By the use of it, of it we shall carefully distinguish between language, culture, and physical type. Thus, the Celtic language and the Hallstatt culture may spread over the Alpine race or vice versa. So really from these sources here, we can gather that there was a race of uh, brown Alpine people who were ancient there in parts of Europe. And this corroborates or backs up what's to be found in the book Origin of the Anglo-Saxon Race. You know, it talks about different, well, there's a couple of different pages where it talks about the uh, Central European Brown Alpine race and uh, the ancient brown race or races of Northern Europe. I'm going to show these uh, pages there, but that's the point right there. And also when it mentions the Celtic language on page 128, by the way, but it mentions that, what does it say? This Celtic language and the Hallstatt culture may spread over the Alpine race or vice versa right there. So it's telling you that there's an interchange of language or culture onto these people, these native brown Alpine race or races of European people. With those who decided to migrate and settle in in their area. Does that make any sense? I hope so. Page 132 highlighted portion reads on the calcareous plains, the people were taller of light complexion with blue or grayish blue eyes and having fine teeth. In the upland areas of a granitic formation, the people were stunted, dark in complexion with very poor teeth. These groups used distinct dialects that's it for that one right there so there you go a population who were dark in complexion and stunted in stature or height that goes in tandem with the information that we uh, previously were uncovering in not only this presentation but other presentations so let's move on pages 321 and 322 um, highlighted portions Page 321 down at the bottom reads, leaving aside for the moment the question whether this in any sense implies that the original Celts were a dark people. Let us be assured that the local persistence of the Celtic speech is nothing more nor less than a phenomenon of isolation today. Drop down. Uh, Okay, Fitzner observed the same phenomenon in Alsace, where, as in Britain, a dark population has been overrun by a tectonic one. One detail of our map confirms us in this opinion that a primitive dark population in these islands, now mainly of Celtic speech, has been overlaid by a lighter one. So both pages 321 and 322, that's dealing with a migration right there. I will get into that later in future presentations, but really the main point is that this uh, primitive or the first brown population, brown complected people, the brunette population, they were um, kind of displaced or overrun or overran by uh, a lighter Aryan element, Turkish element, Russian steppe element. So that's all that's saying. Page 324 highlighted portion reads, one of these he tells us in the 11th chapter of his Agricola was the Caledonian, red haired and tall. The other, that of the Salurs in Southern Wales with a dark complexion and curly hair. He also notes the similarity in appearance between the Southern Britons and the Gauls 
and suggests a Germanic origin for the Caledonians, an Iberian one for the Welsh, and a Gallic one for the English. Then Hernandez or Jornandes, <laughs> an early Italian commentator, added fuel to the flame by amending Tacitus words concerning the Salures of Wales, giving them not only dark complexions but black curly hair. Highlighted portion of page 326 reads, it seems to be most clearly represented in the Southern Welsh, the Western Furbolg Irish, and possibly in the short and dark remnants throughout Scotland. All right, so for page 326, let's add more context to it and go up above it, the highlighted portion. So Professor Reese right here, he's more of a um, oculocutaneous or skin, eyes, and hair expert right there. So let's drop down to uh, where it says the difficulty is. As we have said that all head forms in Britain today are similar. So now he's talking about the skin. Skins including therewith, of course, hair and eyes supply the necessary proof. They suffice to render the Iberian theory highly probable. Okay, so he says that it should be observed by no means, well, by no means implies any Basque affiliates, I mean affinities, for this little people is in no wise typical of any great racial group. The theory is far broader than that. Okay, but then he says, all Europe, as we shall hope to prove, contains the same primitive Mediterranean substratum. He's talking about the primitive people, man, the first people that was there. And then we already know what um, the place of the Welsh says about the uh, the Iberian type of people, you know. So then it says that um, it would be analogous uh, if in Britain any other condition prevailed. They, they talk about the substratum, and this. We're going into what I um, read earlier. This substratum is quite widely diffused, but it seems to be most clearly represented in the Southern Welsh, the Western Furbolg Irish, and possibly in the short and dark remnants throughout Scotland. So it's kind of tying this in with the information that we already went over especially in the place of the Welsh when it talks about um, the short, dark element or racial group was widely over all of Europe, but then invasions start turning it into ethnological islands as far as this uh, brunette complected race of people is concerned. Page 330. Um, highlighted portion down at the bottom reads the most characteristic facial feature of the old British populations be they Scotch, Irish, Welsh, old black breed or Bronze Age as compared with the Anglo-Saxon is irregularity and ruggedness. The mouth is large, the upper lip broad, the cheek bones prominent in the Bronze Age type. As we have seen, the nose is large and prominent in most of the other earlier types. It is often merely broad at the nostrils. Okay, so now looking at this part right here, it talks about different, I guess, descriptions or character, racial characteristics of the people. But my thing is, I just wanted to focus on the old black breed right there of the bronze age now all these other features right there when it when it's talking about you know uh, their lips and nose and all of that well melanated people even in africa the continent on the continent of africa they have different features so i'm not just going to attack on one type of feature for all melanated people 
because I don't believe in that. I've, I've seen it firsthand. So, again, my my area of focus is on this phrase right here, old black breed. Let's move on. Page 331, highlighted portion reads, the middle pair, the little dark men, are representative of probably the oldest element of all in Scotland. This corresponds closely to the salures of Wales or the small dark fur bulbs west of the Shannon in Ireland. The curly hair shown in both our examples is, I am informed by Dr. Bedo, very common among men of this type. Page 466, the highlighted portion reads, we are strengthened in this assumption that the earliest Europeans were not only long-headed, but also dark-complexioned. By various points in our inquiry thus far, we have proved the prehistoric antiquity of the living Cro-Magnon type in southwestern France, and we saw that among these peasants, the prevalence of black hair and eyes is very striking. And comparing types in the British Isles, we saw that everything tended to show that the brunette populations of Wales, Ireland, and Scotland constituted the most primitive stratum or stratum of population in Britain. Furthermore, in, the, in that curious spot in Garfaniana, where a survival of the ancient Ligurian population of northern Italy is indicated, there also are the people characteristically dark. Judge, therefore, either in the light of general principles or of local details, it would seem as if this earliest race in Europe must have been very dark. It was a Mediterranean in its pigmental affinities and not Scandinavian. Okay, drop down. These Berbers and their fellows, in fact, shading off as they do into the Negro race south of the Sahara, we must regard as having least departed from the Aboriginal European traits. And in Europe proper, the brunette, long-headed Mediterranean race is but slightly aberrant from it. So now let's go back to page 466 right here. And as you can see, there's some things that kind of stand out right there. You can see that it says that the Europeans were not only long headed, but also dark complexioned. Where a survival of the ancient Ligurian population of Northern Italy is indicated, there also are the people characteristically dark. And then finally, number three, the earliest race in Europe must have been very dark. Now, this is not like an Antonio Banderas type of complexion right there because he's not very dark. He's not dark complexion. He's not characteristically dark like that. I, I just found that interesting right there. Now let's make a pivot to the Journal of the Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland. And we're gonna check out page 176. Page 176 of the highlighted portion reads, Long before the Roman conquest, the intrusive Aryan Celt had been intermarrying with the older inhabitants of the country, who doubtless belonged to more than one race. The result being that the so-called Celtic race is an amalgamation of races differing physiologically, but dominated by a common moral and intellectual character. The consequence of subjection for a long series of generations to the same conditions of life. It has become a common place of ethnology that the so-called Celtic race includes not only the fair complexion Aryan Celt, but also the black Celt or Iberian with the dark skin, black hair and eyes and small limbs. The subject, however, is much more complex than this simple division would imply. We have seen that under the red Celt are included two distinct varieties 
the black kilt is equally irreducible to a single type while the fact that the two types of red and black recur in the same family my own for example not only indicates their long continued intermixture but suggests the existence of intermediate varieties so as you can indeed see right here it is talking about the african type presence of these people right here these people are described as brown they're described as the alpine brunette or brown race the ancient alpine race and um the complexion is dark it's a very dark brunette type and all of that it's talking about an african type people so let me go into this book right here entitled the black kings of europe by anu imbantu and this is a sentiment that i share right here or i've adopted the same sentiment that he has so let's examine it and get a clearer understanding of what i will be using from here on out or going forward there are two points we would make in response firstly being black does not necessarily mean being african because indigenous black people are presently found in places outside of africa the further back in history one goes the more places one finds outside africa with black populations that is because indigenous populations everywhere were once black it is the consequence of an african origin for this reason where we have evidence of a black connection but no direct evidence of an african connection we will describe the subject as having african type ancestry rather than african ancestry i will be saying african type when i'm talking about people that have a origin of africa but they are far removed from africa and develop you know different cultures and uh, customs and everything so on and so forth that's divergent well basically people who are divergent from the people on the african continent now i know that that explanation wasn't good enough and i know that there will be people who are um pro-black and um part of the di diaspora who's gonna be like man you just hate being you ashamed and all that no no i'm not hey i'm proud of what i am i'm proud of who i am you know, I'm proud of the melanin, you know, I'm dark skin, cool. But this is what I mean right here. You know, I'm just talking about people who are far removed from the continent that they originated from. And I say African continent and the near eastern region of the world. Now, you know what? Let me not explain it. Let me give a video right here and let me let this this um woman from the African continent, explain it from her vantage point as someone who's connected in Africa or with Africa. Let her, um, let's see her vantage point from the person that's inside looking out instead of the person that's outside looking in. That's all I know. They are not really Africans but they are Africans with a perspective of Americans. They are more of uh, American culture into them. So they can't be Africans, they are Americans. Okay, so you don't consider black Americans to be like fully Africans? No, it is just the color. But their um, way of living, the way they take things, they take them in an American way, not in an African way. It is just the color. So the color is the only thing that's African about them? Yes, that's what I think. Now, do you consider black Americans to be real Africans? Yeah, I think they are real Africans. Although, when they are with their fellow Africans, I think there's some racist. They, they don't feel too proud to be Africans because they think um, 
they're still not in that level of being Africans because they, they are now in a different kind of level. So I don't think they're too proud to be Africans. Yeah. Okay, so you think maybe black Americans think they're better than Africans. Yeah, that's what I think. They think they're better than Africans, and yet they're Africans. So that's one thing I don't like so much about them. Yeah. Okay, now where did you get that impression? Like, what makes you think that? What makes me think that is that a lot of people that visit Uganda or African countries, they are not normally black Americans. They, they are white most of the time. They don't, like, come in, in Africa more often like whites do. They are always in their own, in, in America. They don't, they don't take time to come back home and feel the source of, of how home is like. So I think that's why. So what are the cultural differences between African Americans and Ugandans? Let's find out. Okay, so what are the cultural differences between black Americans and Ugandans? Uh, for that, I can't really tell because what I know, in Uganda, we are so welcoming. And that, I told you, I think we are all the same people because you're also, like, Americans are so welcoming and it's not like Indians that they are so segregative. I'm sorry to say that because, yeah, yeah they are so segregative. I think even Arabs, because yeah. they love their culture. Yeah. I think they can't, American people can marry Ugandans, yeah. but Indians or some Arabs, it's not easy to marry Ugandan. Yeah, it's true. They think the other way around. You get what I mean? Yeah, so I guess um, when Americans come here, they mix in with the locals and interact and become yeah. close with the local people. Yeah. So there's your three different viewpoints right there. You have one that's like, hey, I fully agree that we're different, then they're not like us. Then you have one that's in the middle that's like, huh, yeah, kind of, kind of no, kind of yes. And then you have another one that's like, hey, yeah, we're the same. So, but they all acknowledge a cultural difference. And that's what I'm getting at right there. So let's go back to this article right here, this New York Times article origin of the white race all the way back in 1904. Now let's look at the second paragraph. Okay, it says that the old theory has long been exploded by such able men as Professor William Z. Ripley of Columbia. And let's, let's check out his, uh, his work right here. Races of Europe. Okay, now then Professor Giuseppe Sergi Professor of Anthropology, University of Rome, Italy. His work is History of the Mediterranean Races. Dr. Brinton, Professor of Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences. His work is The Races of Men and the Study of the Human Types by M. Vernot of the Smithsonian Institution report for 1902 okay so remember those sources right there and the author of those sources now the whole point of everything is that just like in this paragraph which, which paragraph is that one two three all right the third paragraph the earliest europeans were long-headed but dark in color okay and they resemble dolicephalic Negroes of Africa. Okay, and the earliest races of Europe must have been very dark. Okay, that's the point right there. Now, the change was that more people came in. People from the stands, the stands region came in and became stands. <laughs> yeah, they even stands today. But, you know, that's Central Asia right there. Okay, you know, like Kazakhstan, um, even Pakistan, you know, had, were, was uh, countries that were Aryanized. <laughs> so now, the whole point of this video is that, okay, at one time, that was a dark continent. But now, with uh, 
various migrations and settlements by the people of the stands or Central Asian region, you see that there's a mixture that took place. So you can tell who's mixed and who's not now. Okay, so with that, I think that puts a cap on it and wrapping this whole presentation up, this part two presentation. So um, I guess Melanated Europe part three will come down the pipeline in the near future. Okay, so guys, take care and teach your fam all of this stuff. Later.